Today's program is brought to you by Trace Vistas Recovery, located in San Juan Capistrano, California, an evidence-based and holistic healing sanctuary run by Dr. Daniel Hedrick. He's the same gentleman who treated me back in 2007. Check him out at tracevistasrecovery.com or give him a call at toll-free 844-900-0444. Trace Vistas employs the most dedicated and respected in the field of addiction recovery, Their team of proven individuals tailors treatments to suit each individual's addiction rehabilitation needs, and their complete staff is ready to help you get back on track to a full and enjoyable life. Trace Vistas Recovery, healing one family at a time. Welcome to the Todd Z Zcast, everybody. My name is Todd Zalkins, recorded live here in Long Beach, California, where we talk about a little bit of everything, a little bit of recovery, a little bit of this, that, and the other. Some things relevant and highly irrelevant. We're here to share with you what's really going on. Oh, man. We are rolling live right now, and, uh, and I am just absolutely thrilled to, to, have, uh, to have this guest on with us today. Uh, today we have... Deanna Jordan, who is a highly trained clinician with over 20 years of experience working with clients in recovery. She's a marriage and family therapist who specializes in maintaining healthy relationships. Her expertise has placed her into the spotlight, which has landed her as a regular guest uh, appearing on the Dr. Phil show, as Mm. well as Jane Velez Mitchell, National Geographic's Taboo and has also been published in Elle Magazine and the Huffington Post. Deanna also has a bachelor's degree from UCI, as well as a master's of counseling in psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute. And am I correct? You're currently working on your doctorate? Correct. I'm currently a PsyD candidate, a doctoral candidate. Look at that. And I'm, 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 almost, I'm, I'm almost done here. She's also a state-certified drug and alcohol counselor, also known as KDAC, As a recovering addict herself, Deanna brings a breadth of personal experience to her clinical leadership and believes that a comfortable, structured, and supportive environment is a central part of maintaining long-term sobriety. Last but not least, as a current Woman of the Year candidate, Deanna is campaigning to raise funds for LLS blood cancer research in honor of local children who are blood cancer survivors. Wow. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Deanna, That's a good intro. Deanna, good morning, and thank you so much good for morning. joining us. It's I'm, so good to be here. I was looking forward to this all week because we have a bunch to talk about, and before we get started, I want to share with the viewers and the listeners something that uh, I want them to check out, which is this book. If you guys have not heard of the book called Dreamland, written by Sam Quinones, it is the true tale of America's opiate epidemic. And I read a lot of stuff about this problem. And if you haven't heard of it, please get it. If you're intrigued about what's really going on, there is no greater document in my humble estimation that talks about the problem and documents it better than this. And it really, really goes deep. And the print is in like 0.5. Get a load of this. <laughs> if you don't have reading glasses, you're going to need them by about <laughs> page 30. You'll be at like an eye surgeon by about the third chapter. Um <laughs> <laughs> but this Getting your LASIK on. <laughs> for sure. You'll be at LASIK by about halfway through. <laughs> um, but this gentleman, Sam Quinones, has written a a document that is so unbelievable. And it talks about how just the pill the pill mills got this thing rolling years and years ago, as well as the, how the black tar heroin infiltrated from from a global perspective. Check out Dreamland. And uh, I, I am pimping it to tell you that this will educate you and really, really bring you up to speed as to how we got where we are today. So, okay. With that being said, um, now I got to read it. Now you got to read it. Now I'm super excited to read it. I now, wonder if it comes in Kindle and you could raise the font. Oh, hell yeah. That would be much better for y- me. You can do that. I'll do it. You can get it on Kindle. Yeah. I like it. What's going on, Deanna? Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to be here. I was like, so I, I was just talking about how I really like to break up the routine and do something fun, you know, because I do the same thing every day, all week, all year. So this is a fun thing for me. Well, I'm glad that you're already having fun. And the first question that I always want to ask, are you comfortable? I'm so comfortable. I'm in this weird sitting position, but it like feels good. I really? don't know why. I, I like how my legs down for the first time. Like I'm usually like all jacked up in like this lazy boy position and, 
and people are always giving me crap because it's like, you know, the guests are always sitting over here and I'm like, like I'm on like in some first class <laughs> seat. So I'm, I'm just going to have coffee. Like falling asleep. Uh, yeah. I'm so comfortable. It's like, what happened to him? He's out. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit for a second here about your personal story, because I know for certain that you've helped so many people in, in your, in your, in your chosen profession. Mm. And, and, and we're going to, we're going to comment on that big time later on, later on in, in the gig here. But, um, can, can we just cast a little light here on, on your personal story for a minute and what kind of brought you into the work that you do? Yeah, totally. Well, just last week I celebrated 29 years of sobriety. Congratulations. So I got sober when I was six. No, that's a lie. <laughs> man, man. So you, God, you, 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 God, so like you're in, you're like kindergarten and you, and, and, and you like checked yourself in. Sometimes I still lie. <laughs> yeah, that's my gig. Sometimes I still lie. No. <laughs> so I've been sober for a really long time. And when I got sober, I came into this lifestyle living in my car and I couldn't keep a job and I dropped out of college. My parents showed up at my college graduation and they were like, uh, uh, looking for me. And I was in the Bahamas with some friends so yeah that wasn't a good gig and then um, I came back and my mom said do you want to get sober and I said I don't want to die and I never thought before that what I was doing was going to cause me to die but the words just came out of my mouth I don't want to die which I don't know where that came from but they did so we checked into this horrible treatment center that wasn't in in that's not in in business anymore thank god was it located here in California yes okay yeah it was in um like Buena Park okay Anyway, so I, I, I don't know why, but for some reason I just decided that the people around me knew more about life than I did and I wanted what they had. So I started following direction and doing things and attending a lot of support groups and um, it just changed my life. And I never wanted to be a therapist. Uh, quick, did, it st did sobriety stick for you? Uh, did it stick? Yeah, it stuck. Wow. So, so 29 years and, and, and relapse is not a part of your story. I relapsed one time when I was like one year sober. I took two hits off a joint. Okay. Which was the dumbest thing I've ever done. And it just made me instant paranoid and it was bad weed. And then I woke up the next day and I was like, oh shit, this sucks. Were, were you a big weed smoker? Because no, I hate weed. Me too. I, I wasn't. This is my, this is my arithmetic when it comes to weed. And this is just what it looks like for me. Big bong hit, three large pizzas and, and Netflix. And sleeping. Bed. It's like, yeah, it I'm already a uh, sleepy person. Yeah. Like there's no need for me to be more sleepy. Yeah. That sleepy's not a good gig. Double double pepperoni, double, you know, mushroom. And um, and I need like a really comfortable, <laughs> at least a queen size, preferably a California king. <laughs> yes. And then you wake up the next day and you're just like, uh Yeah, and a couple large Slurpees. And weed's I'm like through. one of the few things I could quit doing on my own, which is weird. Yeah, that wasn't an issue. I didn't like but weed other, at all. Other stuff. So was. yeah, that's what I relapsed on. But then after that I went this this is ridiculous. I don't want to do anything. I just want my life to be clean and pure. And so, and so you were taking this thing drop dead seriously uh, and you've sure. done it ever since. And, and I know how passionate that you are about your own recovery. And, um, one of the things that I always like to ask, um, recovering people when they're on the show is, did you, have you had, uh, a handful of moments or a, a moment or two that stick out in your sobriety that was like, one of those things where it's like it, the rubber is really meeting the road here. Oh, one hundred percent. When it when everything is challenged, and like maybe you don't want to stick around anymore. I say all the time, I get through these periods that are go or grow. Oh, I'm familiar with that one. So yeah, we do go or grow. Like around certain like times in my sobriety and my recovery, I've gone. I don't know if I can do this anymore. It's just too much work to look at myself, and so I'm gonna either go back out and relapse, or I'm gonna grow. Can you can you take that a, a step further as far as like I mean could it have been either an occupational situation well, a I job a or a loss of a, okay I went through a divorce in my first marriage and um, I remember calling a friend of mine who I had tr flown to treatment um, like five years earlier so now he's like five years into recovery and I call him and I go I just want to drink it's just too yeah. painful this divorce is too painful I just want to drink and he says the only thing that can make this worse is for you to drink. The only thing that can make you feel worse is to drink. And I don't know why that just stuck for me. And I was like, I don't want to be worse. That's I don't want to feel worse than I feel now. Do you think that absent that phone call that a drink would have happened? Possibly. It's it's and that's been and that's been true in my own recovery too, where 
I can't I can't tell you why my hand has picked up the phone like for instance right. when, for instance when my father took his life. Mm. I don't know why I called somebody. I don't know. I, I can't answer that. It happened and someone came to help me and I didn't get loaded. Kind of like in your situation here, you did that and maybe that prevented you from I like to call it it's prevented me from my own suicide. That's when how I seriously was about I look at it. Seventeen years sober, I wasn't go I wasn't doing any of my support group stuff or working with other people or doing any of the stuff that I do to con- to maintain my sobriety. And I was about to clean the house and my son's friend spent the night and he had a bottle of ADD medication. And I said to myself, I could take a handful of that and clean the house. It didn't look like a relapse at all. It just looked like I'm gonna, it made 100% perfect sense to me. Like saying it right now, I feel like laughing, but it made total sense to me. I'm going to take a bottle. I'm going to take a few of these and clean the house. I'm not going to relapse. I'm just going to clean the house. And this little tiny voice said, call your mentor. Just call her and see what she thinks because I was so used to calling her. And I was like, no, I'm not going to call her. I'm just going to take a few of these and clean the house. And this voice said, just because I was so used to calling people and asking for help. So as I was saying it out loud to her on the phone, I realized I was one breath away from relapsing. And that, and that could have changed everything. Everything. Do you kind of look at it too? Like, um, like sometimes we just don't know that if we light that fuse, we may or may not have that luxury of coming back. 100%. 100%. People tell me all the time, I'm just going to like go out for a few days and then come back into recovery. And I go, I hope that happens for you. I hope that works because what if you can't get back? What if you die first? Mm Mm-hmm. What yeah. if you just can't get back? What, or what if you take 10 years making the story worse? Yeah, and, and for those of you, um, to, to fill you in a little bit more, Deanna is the, are you, aren't you the executive director or the clinical director? Clinical of, director, yes. Uh, of New Method Wellness down in San Juan Capistrano. And they run a really, really good program down there. And I've seen them help a tremendous amount of people. And, uh, you know, it's that attitude that, that we can... <laughs> Where do, first off, well, where does that come from? And the truth is, that's just the disease at work. It is. Right? And it's hard at work. Right. And, and you're so right in, in that um, how many times do we see someone who's here today, and ne- sometimes we might see them again, and oftentimes never. And it could be, I mean, if I had control over going in and coming out, I, I wouldn't be an addict. I'd just go out every weekend and then get sober <laughs> every Monday. Right? I just go out on Friday night and then get sober on Monday. I'd do that for the rest of my life. But I don't know when I'm going to come back. I don't know if I'm going to come back. I don't know if I'm going to die. I don't know if I'm going to kill a family driving. You know, I was I, I had this uh, a talk recently with, with someone else in recovery, and we were talking about the first drink. Mm-hmm. We we're talking about the or the first ingestion of a drug. And, you know, I've been sober for a couple of days now, and 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 the, and the thought came to me is, you know, I wonder what it would feel like. I kind of remember what drinking was like mm-hmm. and, and how warm it made me feel or how, how the drugs made me feel. But then I kind of went like, shit. And then a couple hours later, which hotel am I at? You know, <laughs> am, I, am I en route to Vegas and that kind of thing? And <laughs> we're talking about just the, the guaranteed terror. Yes. The, you know, the first 10 minutes, we always, you know, it's just a common theme. But the, don't forget, Todd, it's you know, going to be worse than it was. Big time. Because no, no, no. There was no, rom- there was no romanticizing. As but, you've been sober all this time, your disease has continued to progress. Yeah. I know I'm not telling you something you don't know. No, but no. But, but we, we were just, we were talking about the first five minutes versus five hours later mm-hmm. and how that five hours later is a lock with us. Mm-hmm. It's just an absolute lock. Mm-hmm. And what I want to, uh, um, what I want to ask you next is, at what point in your in your recovery did you decide that you know I want to I want to go into the um, the therapeutic and, and counseling side of things and help people and help people out? You know, a friend of mine who was a psychologist said to me, "You should be a therapist." When I was like, I don't know, a few years sober, and I was like, I don't want to sit and listen to people's problems all day. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I do not want to do that. I would not be good at it, and it's dumb. And then he said, "No, no, go for your master's degree," and I was like, "I'm not doing that." And then another friend of mine opened a treatment center and she said, can you come work at my treatment center? And I was like, sure, I would love to. I thought it was just like being of service and being helping her. She goes, no, I'm going to pay you. I'm like, you're going to bring me money to do this? Yeah, sure, I'll do it. And I just had this natural flair for working with people that I loved. Because I always say in therapy, there are two things. There's an art and there's a science. A lot of us are born with the art, but not the science. The science Mm. is something you learn. A lot of people are like really good at the science, but they aren't born with the art. 
And you, and you spent a great deal of time though going to school for your. Yes. If you're, it, 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 this is a craft. I mean, you develop you, you, you develop your own skill set and your own style for what you do. Correct. Right. Yes, and I've spent many hours in supervision, which is the mo- one of the most important things about being a therapist is constantly looking at yourself. Like, what am I doing in the room? What am I doing in the room? Is it about me? Is it about my client? What's going on? Supervision is so important, and I know that there are therapists on the planet that just skip supervision, which oh is gosh. completely unethical, right? In my book, but it supervision changed my whole career about who I was. Like I've always been good at this, always had a knack for it, but supervision really honed it for me. Yeah, I um I, I, I did my my licensing hours with you guys down in San Juan Capistrano and and some of the some of the neatest things that I learned while ju- was just observing you in your element. Thank you. And and to see how you first off handled people. Mm. But one of the greatest things that 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 I took my takeaway from watching you hands down was the empathy, compassion, and on top of it all was how you listen to people. Mm. Isn't, don't you consider the way you listen and mm-hmm. the way you actually posture and listen, the, the way you hold yourself when you're looking at someone mm-hmm. in this type of, in these environments. I mean, for instance, we don't hold ourselves when we're talking with these people who are raw and thrashed. We don't hold them in contempt with this, you know, this contemptive yes. look. Yeah. We have to be holding ourselves in a certain way mm-hmm. and we have to be empathetic and compassionate. Compassion is the number one thing. You know, I saw the Dalai Lama speak a few years ago at the Honda Center and I was like, what's the Dalai Lama going to say? This is fascinating. And he said the number one thing that has changed Western society has been Alcoholics Anonymous. The Dalai Lama said that. Is that right? That blew me away. How cool. Because I, I know that Alcoholics Anonymous helps a lot of people. I'm not going to break any traditions, but I know that it's the most valuable thing I've ever seen to help addicts. Hmm. So uh, with that said, the next thing he said was the thing that we need to learn the most is compassion. Like if I'm judging somebody because they came in hot and wet and rode hard, that is not going to help them at all. Nobody beats themselves up worse than an addict. So true. So if I beat you up, if I beat you up and you're already beating yourself up, what's the point? You're just going to walk around beat up. I need to like find a place of compassion. Yeah. And just be like, what, you know, what are we going to do to just solve whatever's right in front of you? What are some of the other attributes that you feel makes for a really strong therapist? Uh, can, can you can you share with listeners like like what do you think makes for a very strong, outstanding uh, therapist? I want to say that like. My favorite therapists in the my some of my favorite therapists that I've ever seen, like my idol, one of my idols that I work with, um, that actually taught one of my classes is Dr. Michael Elliott in Mission Viejo, and he he's just kind of like he's so in tune to his own style. You know what I mean? He's not trying to emulate anybody or follow a book or you know he's very well trained and you know been through jumped through all the hoops and lots of experience and lots. But I watched I've watched him before and I've thought you know it's okay to, to have my own style. And if you if you're out there and you're looking for a therapist to help you, make sure that they're they're focused on you. It's not about me. We're not going to go to you know. I mean, you and I talk about stuff sometimes about me, but but we're here to solve what's going on with you. I mean, in, 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 isn't it also just like absolutely imperative that the individual has a sense of trusting you? Yes. If there isn't that trust, you're going to get nowhere. They, I believe that research says the number one thing that's valuable about treatment, about therapy, about being treated in a therapist office is the connection. Mm-hmm. Like if we can't connect, if you go into therapy, I always say this, go in and interview a therapist. Don't just go in and be like, well, there's a therapist and I, so they know everything that's right. That's not true. Don't give your power away to a therapist. Go in and see if you connect. If you feel like there's a connection, if you feel like you can trust them, if you feel like they're holding you in with compassion and empathy, then that might work. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad that you said that. And, and here's, there's something else I want to bring up. And that is, I hear this all the time, like prior to, uh, I've got a couple of interventions on the horizon and this, and I'm sure you've heard this so many times you probably can't count, but 
for instance, I've got this, this, this wife, uh, I'm going to intervene on, on her husband. And he's like, well, he's going to therapy. Mm-hmm. You good, know? Good, good luck with that. You, you know, and it's like, how many times do we have to tell people that you can therapy yourself into the ground and spend tens of thousands of dollars? You know, this individual is going into these sessions loaded high. I said to a, a client one time, <laughs> you know? I said that. Uh, this client, this guy comes in and he's telling me, my son, my son, my son. And I said, why are you wasting your money? Yeah. I mean, he's giving me money every week. And I say to him, why don't you save your money for when your son's ready to get sober? Right. And he was like, no one's ever told me to not give them money. I go, I just feel like we could do more work if your son was ready. Come back and call me in five years or ten years. But stop giving me money. If your son's not ready to do it, the deal, this is a huge waste of your money. Prior, prior to my coming into, into recovery in 2007, when I was, um, when I was dating a woman, I, I was actually, just to appease her, I was going to see a therapist in, in San Clemente, and I was so just ripped off of pills and cocaine. I would actually, <laughs> I would excuse, Sorry, I would funny. excuse, well, it is, you know, it's funny now, I would excuse myself in the session, excuse me, uh, <laughs> doc, I've got to go use the restroom. <laughs> I would run to the restroom and pack my beak, just pack my fucking ah, beak I love and that. come back so high off Coke. And I would, because I, I couldn't talk when I was high. That is I, so I, would, I would have the doc, hilarious. I'd say, I would tell him to talk to me. He'd be like, what are you saying? You, you just got to talk to me right now. It never <laughs> ceases to amaze me that yeah. I talk to clinicians who are colleagues of mine and they'll say, um, I don't work with addicts. Mm. And I'm like, they just draw the line, huh? Well, they don't know they work with addicts. They have people like you in the bathroom getting high, coming back in, and they're not aware of the addiction. You don't understand. I I had too much Gatorade before I came. Right, right. I just needed to use the restroom. Right. And I'm like, (laughs) no, you work with addicts. You just don't know it. I actually, it's so funny. I I tried to locate him because I wanted to make amends to him for my my behavior. Yeah. I absolutely, and, and I could not find him. Oh. He's a wonderful, wonderful man, too. A, a good heart, and I think that he truly wanted to help me. I've told clients, I can't see you until you go to a 12-step program and bring me a 30-day chip. Nice. Because this isn't working. You're high as a kite. I, I've had clients leave my office, and I've called the police because I don't want them drinking and driving. Well, you would have loved working with me in uh, 2006. I would have had you arrested. I would have had you arrested. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, I mean, one eye over here, one eye, like give me a bib. I would ask for like a big bowl of like yogurt and granola and like how'd you put on Dog the Bounty Hunter while we're talking. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> I had a therapist when I was in early recovery and she had a giant bowl of M&M's next to her, next to her thing. Yeah. And I would just sit there and binge my way <laughs> through therapy, not feeling a damn thing, yeah. just eating M&Ms. And finally one day I go, I don't think this is working for me. I think that I'm like super high on sugar during our entire session. You were just going through it. Yes. Yeah. Like at the theater it would have been like 67 bucks worth of M&Ms. Exactly. And she had this <laughs> ginormous ball. I'm like, you should take that away because people <laughs> like me are not going to pay attention to you. Now, um, <laughs> so you've, you've spent a heck of a lot of time, um, you know, learning your craft and you continue, you know, you, you spent the better part of 20 years in the field, right? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you've seen a lot change uh-huh. in not only personally as far as treating people, but how do you, I get a lot of emails about this subject matter and I want to bounce this off of you. How do you view the, you know, the, the way treatment is often being viewed because I got to tell you, there's there, there's so many good treatment centers out mm-hmm. there. And unfortunately, we know that it just takes some bad ones. Mm-hmm. You know, what is your take on what you're seeing often out there with the guy with six months sober opening a treatment center? Jiminy Christmas. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you thinking? <laughs> you don't even know what's working for you. How can you know what's going to work for other people? But it's he, so ridiculous. <laughs> I think that the treatment industry like sociologically is going to be like the mortgage industry. Remember when everybody made a ton of money in the mortgage industry and then it dumped and then only the people that were serious about it stayed in it. Uh I think that's what's going to happen in treatment. People are going to stop making all this money. And then the people like new method wellness who are actually serious about helping people. And that's their first priority are going to stay in the business when people are going to be falling off all over. Yeah. I, I actually had, I had an intervention not too long ago and this was the first I have heard of this one. 
I've heard about the body brokering stuff, mm-hmm. and and that scared the shit out of me. But this was a new one that I haven't heard. I guess I don't know if you've heard of it, but I guess there's situations where there's people who are paid to relapse and they're paid to be in treatment. I actually I, I've never heard of that. I have a girlfriend who owns a treatment center, and she called one of those guys and like undercover. She had her her employee yeah. call him and undercover say, "Yeah, we want to come to treatment. I'll relapse." Da da da. And the guy was. And then they said, if you ever do this again, we're calling the police. I, I mean, it's just, um, I think that there should be a special I task force. I think I force. sent it to you. Didn't I send it to you? We, you actually shared this with me when, uh, well, hell, we can just now cross over this topic right now. <laughs> um, and when, when, hell, you know, in our, we had a session not too long ago, and, and we can talk about this because I have no problem sharing with it. In fact, you know, in, in my own recovery, I, I got to a point in, in my sobriety where I was hitting some walls. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm, I'm blessed today for what recovery, the, rep- the, the program of recovery has given me. It certainly saved my life. And, and there were certain aspects of it that it just wasn't helping. And um, I thank God that I met you and, and I came to you with, uh, with some issues that that I feel like uh, that I, I know today that left unaddressed had I not addressed them. I'm, uh, I'm drop dead serious when I say this, that I don't think that I would be either sober or alive mm-hmm. had I not, um, connected with you on a level that we, that we connected with mm-hmm. to do some work. And I want to talk about that for a second. And that was, you know, I had to face some very, um, I'm open about it. I faced, I talked about it in the film a little bit, but I dug deep on some, um, issues relating to trauma mm-hmm. And one of the things that was scaring me about address about addressing this was, first off, who do I talk to, mm-hmm. and um, is am I going to be in judgment? There was mm-hmm. so much fear and um, peeling stuff back, and shit. I didn't know how much Kleenex I was going to use, and it didn't <laughs> just take a, a session or two. We spent quite a while on it, yeah. and I'm I'm forever um, forever grateful for mm. all the 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 pain and the healing that that you, know, you walked me through so much and so um and i i thank you from the bottom of my heart mm. for for what you've done for me it's my pleasure for sure and i want people to know out there that you know i think y- y- you mentioned that term to me you know in session that you know we can reach these times in our recovery where we either grow or, you, or you'll go if, if you if the if the shit hits the fan mm-hmm. Because I was finding that no matter how many meetings I was going mm-hmm. to, no matter how many people I was sponsoring, all this stuff, it wasn't going away. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes we need outside help. Yeah, and I think that most 12-step recovery programs support that. And it even says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that when you need outside help, you should get it. Yeah. And um, I'm a big believer that trauma and addiction go hand in hand. They just do. And there's so much research out there that says trauma causes, causes addiction, genetics causes addiction. And I mean, you can find research to support anything either way. So we don't really, we can't say 100% for sure what causes addiction. We don't know 100%. We just don't know enough about yeah, uh, I'm it's glad very it. It's very two dimensional. I'm glad you mentioned that because I know myself well enough, by the way, that in that even if I hadn't had some some situations happened to me when I was young. I, I still think that I would have been a drug addict. Yeah. What I do know is that with the trauma that occurred to me as a as a young person, it sure as hell ramped things up. And oh, it, for and sure. It, you know, and it sure as hell gave me additional reasons to to fight more and to be more of an you know an anarchist at heart and to be angry, fueled by anger and some rage. Mm-hmm. You know, does that make oh so much sense? Right. Yeah. Um, and so what's, what's really interesting is, um, is the freedom that, that you can, ex- that, that I experienced from going from feeling like a victim mm. to crossing over into more of a survivor. Yeah. And, and you got me there thank and, you. and it's, um, I, I cannot, I cannot begin to thank you, um, enough for, for what you did for me. Mm. I'm so grateful to be the one, the catalyst, you know, that got to be there and do that. <laughs> And like all this work, all this education, all this experience, all this everything is the reason I do this. To watch people heal and help people heal themselves. Um, (laughs) 
you know, it's, uh, it was, it's weird when, when, when you think that you've, um, when you think that you've done all the work mm -hmm. and I'm kind of pausing, so I'm, I'm trying to collect and find the right, the right way to say it. But I remember, um, coming to you and saying that in my heart, I was just going, haven't I kind of done enough already? Mm. And I don't know if I like really have it in me to do anymore because it's like, isn't this shit kind of behind me? Mm -hmm. And what was kind of continuing to happen was it was kind of like every now and again, either being hit by another like runaway truck or a train was uh, of just a, emotional stuff. It's like, how do you get rid of that? And, um, so the reason why I, I share this stuff is, um, is to uh, impress upon anyone who might be going through the same stuff is that uh, not only can it be processed, but, 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 but the healing factor that can take place when you are able to entrust someone like, like a Deanna um, to find someone that you can, that is professional mm -hmm. and knows what they're doing mm -hmm. in a safe place. Mm -hmm. Cause that's what I felt when I did the work with you was I felt safe mm -hmm. And um, there is no greater intangible as that feeling of, of being safe to get over it. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. That's a priceless thing, you know? I truly believe the process is uncover, discover, and discard. I heard that a long time ago in a support group. Uncover, discover, and discard. And I think that most of us are so afraid to uncover it, which is the first part. You know, we don't want to look at that stuff again. It's <laughs> terrifying, right? Who wants to look at that stuff again? And like all, it was so painful when we were going through <laughs> it. Now I'm asking you, can you go back there and feel that those feelings again? And I mean, who wants, I think my business card should say, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Oh, yeah. That was the biggest bum out ever when you told me that. I, Jesus, I'm like sitting there going, kind of going, why am I even doing this? <laughs> what? Do, do I really need to be sitting here? And then the, the discomfort, I'm like, I mean, God, I was like, I don't know, six years sober at the time or something. Cause you and I did it in blocks and in yeah. series of, yeah. and, it and that's the best way to do it God. when you're ready for it. And when people say to me, I, I, my, th this is something I don't like about sometimes therapy, scab picking. I don't like the idea of like going in and picking at your scabs. Like if they're healing, let them heal. Another thing I don't like is when the therapist says, you have to come in, you have to do this and you have to do this. You know your body and your psyche. You'll let me know when you need to come in. I don't need to tell you. I need yeah. to You're resisting. I need to see you everywhere. Yeah. How could I know your body and your psyche better than you do? No. That was, doesn't make any sense. It was good like that because I remember th you know, then we get on like this roll of like, okay, and it was like five weeks in a row. And I was yeah. like, okay, man, I'm going to go take a nap for a week. You yeah. Know? And it all worked out. And so... um and you really are, I mean, you have to know, you really are on the other side of it. Oh, hell yeah. 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 Oh, th oh, there's no doubt and about it. And you have it. been for a long time. There's no doubt about it. And, and, and the, sen the, the, the sense of freedom and, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the sense of feeling less heavy and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff is, is something that, that you promised would happen, but, but there had to be... Uh, you have to walk through. There had to be some some fire to walk through and some yeah. kind of heavy layers of shit to peel back and 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 that's real shit though. Mm -hmm. And and you can't dance around it and and we're talking about very real stuff today, but you know what? We can't uh, we have to address real stuff on the show sometimes in 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 order to um, I think to be really effective in the big picture. Right. Right. And I think like it can't all be heavy. Like we've had lots of times where we laughed and Hell we just yeah. cracked up and we just talk shit to each other and you know, yeah. it's gotta be human. There's gotta be some humanity in there. It can't be just yeah. this clinical room where we're just, you know. I have more fun. Let's talk about fun for a minute. I have more fun today than than I think I've ever had in my life. And you know, the joy factor overall, I wasn't having, let's talk about this in your life. Were you having a lot of fun towards People the People tell me all the time, the end? I don't want to get sober because I'm t I, I'm really scared I won't have any fun. I go, was it fun to wake up in your puke? <laughs> was that fun to be in jail in Mexico? Yeah. Was that fun? Because it wasn't fun for me anymore. If it were more fun than sobriety is, I would still be doing it. For me, sobriety is so much more fun. I'm not scared to do stuff. I yeah. pursue activities that interest me. I'm very excited about life. I do like 
things I've always wanted to do. My dreams are coming true and they've come true. That never happened to me when I was using. Have you noticed, too, that you get a lot of shit done? Yes. <laughs> I never even really give my, for God's sake, for the most part, stuff gets done. And you're, because your priorities are in order, right? <laughs> if you so. just put, like, helping other people first, all the other stuff gets done. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that. there's no doubt about that. And that's, and that's a top priority, you know. I was stoked to get a message this morning about a guy that uh, I care so much, so much about, and he had about 20-something days, and. And he decided to light the fuse again, but now he wants to come back. And it's like, okay, let's go to a meeting tonight. And, um, you know, we, we love him anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we, we love no matter what. Mm -hmm. We don't shoot our wounded. <laughs> no. Never. And, and what's, cool, what's cool about it all is that, like, I'm looking forward to, what's really cool is that when you just, you're, you're looking forward to seeing that person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I know we're doing what we're doing right now. I know what's going on later on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, hey, how can we how can we possibly start over? It's so weird because I have this eternal hope. I don't know where it comes from, but I believe my job is to carry hope. When somebody will come in, they relapse like 50 times and they have three days. I'm like, oh, my God, you have three days. That's so exciting. And the normal people person might be like, yeah, but you've relapsed 50 times. You're not going to make it. And I'm mm. just so hopeful. Absolutely. Like, you have three days. Yay. And I, you yeah. Know. I, um, I often, you, you know, when, when working with someone, they're like, when they say something like, yeah, man, you know what? I, I had six months or I had, mm -hmm. I had two years and, and, and I, and, and they get hung up on this and I lost it. First and foremost, you didn't lose no. anything, meaning you had, you lived those six months or the mm -hmm. or that two years sober. You had, you absolutely had. It. You didn't lose it. All you have is a new sobriety date. Yeah. Like what? What do you mean? Yeah, man, that's exactly right. You didn't lose a damn thing. All you're gaining or having right now is a new sober date. Mm -hmm. So let's not live in this sense of oh man, this gloomy. It's over because I lost everything. Mm -hmm. It's just a new date. Right. We have to try to turn the sense of thinking around uh, to into some type of positive because those two years of sobriety or those six months were still owned and lived sober. I have a girlfriend who was sober 31 years and relapsed. 31 years. And for the last five years, she stopped going to meetings, stopped helping people, stopped being of service, stopped doing all that stuff. And she thought, you know, I'm fine. I think I could have a drink. And then like three days later, she was in, you know, DUI on the floor. Damn. And she always, like, every time that I tell her, I have one more year sober, she looks at me and she goes, don't forget. So she's sober again. Yeah, she's like seven years, I think, or six oh, years. Oh, that's so cool. She's doing great, yeah. But she always tells me, don't forget. It's not because of the time you've been here. It's because of your every day, what you're doing every day. You know, that's. I'm glad that you brought that up, too, because one of the things that, I'm thankful I haven't done is I haven't drifted away. Yeah. I've never forgotten and I hope it never leaves me about the and obviously you haven't either. I haven't forgotten how fucking bad it was. Desperate. I haven't forgotten how how ugly incomprehensible <laughs> demoralization. I pray that I never forget that and and I and I don't ever want to um, give you guys the middle finger, man. Like, yeah. hey, like, hey, you know what? Thanks for the decent life, and yeah. um, <laughs> and I'm just gonna I'm just focus. Gonna take this and go and worry about me because I'm so egotistical. Yeah, I'm so cool, and I can focus on yeah. um, on making a living, and um, and I think I can just stay recovered on my own. I I I'm so convinced that I'm so screwed on my own. Oh. I I know that 100%. I'm still fucking crazy by myself. I know. I'm, I'm actually not as afraid of relapsing as I'm afraid of going crazy. Completely. Like, I, I know I could relapse and I'm afraid of that. But my bigger fear is me without recovery in this head. <laughs> I know, man. Just walking around like a lunatic, you know, just being well, a crazy person. Well, why the isn't it? Isn't it funny how I had I had this this recent thing where I had to travel for a few days and it was just go, 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 go. Yeah. And, um, and there, there was no chance for meetings for like, it was like three days and you mix in tired with not treating the alcoholism and I'm just a freaking mess. Right? And I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm uncomfortable. Like you're saying <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Why is it though? And you get right back in just sitting, you just listen to some people who are in our 
in our fellowship of recovery, and I, I just start to feel better. Like the medicine starts to seep mm-hmm. in, man. Why the hell? If that is an example of just something so much bigger working, there is no greater example to me. Well, I do believe that our program of recovery addresses the disease on a biological, on a sociological, on a psychological, and on a spiritual. Like all those things have to be addressed, which is why therapy alone doesn't work, which is why, Mm -hmm. you know, because therapy isn't addressing your spiritual, your, your biological, all those things have to be addressed for this disease to be worked on. You, you, you absolutely nailed it. I mean, I was at a, uh, I was at a men's meeting this morning, this, and I just love this group. It's just a small, it's on the small side. It's four days a week over here in Naples. And, um, why is it that because I go there, I'm going to be more comfortable working at home today versus if I didn't, not that I wouldn't get through my day, but how much you want to bet I'm going to be a little bit less agitated, yeah. you know, little, you know, this, the little things yeah. I'm a little less rough around the, I'm more smooth, Matt. How do, there's a book explain called the, that. There's a book called the psychology of alcoholics anonymous. And I, I've only read a little bit of it in grad school, but, um, it talks a lot about why it works, like how how twelve step programs address the biopsych, social, spiritual part of our disease. Really? Yeah, and I think it's interesting. For years, I would say, I don't know why it works. I don't know why it works. Why does it work? Why does it work? And now I really don't care. Is it? Uh, I I love that term that that's used called the language of the heart. Yes. And any time. I, I, all I know is that when I hear the la- – because let, let's face it, the heart and the head are two different places. For sure. And, and any time anytime that I'm hearing um, just good stuff, mm-hmm. when I'm hearing good stuff that's, that's focused on, on, on how people are living sober and, and how, they're, um, how they're just living the life or, and, and getting through stuff and in their recovery, something seems to change in me. Mm-hmm. just by listening to them. Mm-hmm. And that's a form of meditation for me. I think so. I think that that's what you would call it, meditation. It quiets my freaking head. Mm-hmm. You know, because my thing's still a blender, man. Right. You know, I don't know. I, I, had a, I had a friend, she used to call it Radio Station K-Fuck. And my <laughs> head is just tuned into Radio Station K-Fuck. <laughs> I want to be a DJ on K-Fuck. And you just need to like tune it back into Radio Station K-Spiritual or K-Serenity or something because it's just on oh, K-Fuck. No, no, I couldn't be on K-Spiritual, but you get me on K-Fuck, I'm there. <laughs> We're already there, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> We're just walking around like we need to change that station. Man, send me a job application. I want to be all over. <laughs> I, I'll start it. I'll do janitor work at K-Fuck. <laughs> Right? Yeah, I'm very attracted to that. Be an to that, intern. To that, yeah, to that place for sure. <laughs> that's where my head is just wired. It's <laughs> wired on radio station K fuck, and I just need to like switch it around and go, okay, what? But for me, support groups and, you know, spiritual recovery and that kind of stuff always moves me over. Yeah. I have a forgetting disease. Like I will wake up in the morning, first thing in the morning, and be like, um, yeah, I'm never going to drink again. And by noon, oh my God, it's $5 margarita night. I forget between breakfast and lunch that I'm never going to drink again. Damn. So I have this forgetting disease. So when I like work steps and do stuff like that, it reminds me that I need to treat this forgetting disease every day, all day. I'll tell you what I have more than that is, is I have a sincere um, a thinking thing of, of, of um, I'm a master isolator. Mm. I do so much stuff on my own and by myself. I mean, like I got this. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. Not that I can recover, but I'm talking about like be around people and withdraw in a heartbeat. Because you're an introvert. You know, that's okay. And, and like, even in my band, it's like I finish a gig and be like, "Where the hell did he go?" I'm like Santa Claus, man. It's you're like, like it, in the bathroom. Like tr- tr- well, the turn around. He's head. in his car. He's already gone. Yeah. Th- like 38 seconds after the gig yeah. is done. I'm an introvert too. I think it's okay to be an introvert, but so, we do live in a culture that says you should be an extrovert. Yeah. And people think you, people like you and I are extroverts because we can work a room, but we're not extroverts. We need alone time to fill back up and that's okay. Okay. I'm glad that I, I'm glad that it's okay to be that way. It is. It's really okay. Yeah, a lot of people just think I'm always running around just, you know, with like, these giant groups of people, I just, I, I don't, I, it, this need, sense of balance, I spend a lot of time alone, man. That's you know? a good thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, because people usually misinterpret the idea of introvert and extrovert. Like they think extrovert means 
that I can work a room. I can work a room. But the real introvert is somebody who needs to go home and refuel, recharge by being alone. Yeah. And then I can go back out and do some more work. Absolutely. But then I got to go home and watch Netflix. <laughs> right? That's exactly right. And then I fill back up and I'm like, okay, I can do this again. Do you find that... Um, do you find that when you see people in a state of change, um, isn't it just uh, one of the one of the coolest things ever when you see someone who's just you get them a certain way, and you fast forward in mm -hmm. time the 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 miracle that that we get to see before us when they start to embrace it. It's crazy. It's like the best part of my job. I'll, and you know I can never predict who's going to make it and who's not. Like some people come in and I go. Uh, like at New Method Wellness with a lot of new people come in and I'll say, oh, they're not going to make it. They, 10 years later, hey, Deanna, I stayed sober. I finished my college degree. And I'm like, oh my God, I would have never thought that. And then some people come in and I'm like, oh, they've got it. They are so doing, they're mm -hmm. doing, the, they're doing, in the parking lot, they're wasted. Yeah, I, I know. Um, I, I just, getting into the odds game and all that yes. stuff, it's like, uh, and I always hate it when uh, uh, there's been some meetings, I'm sure that you've been to where you hear, some guy's like gets up and he takes six months and he hears some asshole say, oh, I would have lost that bet. It's like, don't say that. Yeah. Don't say that. Most people would have lost a bet on me. Uh, uh, shit. Same here. But but my point being is that it, we shouldn't be vocalizing and trying to. That, that, that's not a funny thing to say. Hey, I would have lost that. It's not it's not funny. I ran into you know? some people when I was about three years sober and they were like, I cannot <laughs> believe you're still sober. I cannot believe you. You're made still it. with us, Deanna. Yeah. And I was like, well, I am. So I'm crazy. But, you know, I did a lot of crazy stuff in sobriety, a lot of crazy stuff in sobriety. But I never picked up and I kept telling my secrets and I kept reaching out and trying to help other people. It's um, th that recipe is it's almost it's almost f foolproof it as is. far as protecting us from from the drink of the drug. And, you know, one of the one of the the greatest things I've ever heard and it's just, I heard this at about two years sober I was at a meeting in um in LA in uh it was this um it was in the Crenshaw district in the Crenshaw district and this gentleman said um he was a he is a recovering crack cocaine addict and alcoholic and he said in, in in his disease he was always making the same mistakes always making the same mistakes he goes what I love about recovery is that um I get to make new mistakes. Mm. He goes, the thing is about in recovery, when I make new mistakes, chances are really good that I don't repeat them. Oh, th that's so cool. I thought that was so cool is that he was just talking about he's human. He lives a lot better life. He still makes mistakes, but when he does make one, it's not nearly as bad. And if, and if he does make one, he tends to learn from it. I thought that was pretty cool. That's really good. And the whole concept, like I, I'm either succeeding or growing. Yeah. I'm either succeeding or growing because when I'm not succeeding, I'm growing and I'm learning. Yeah. Would you, uh, how do you feel about the concept of, you know, recovery is, is, is about changing and growing. It is, you know, that you set aside the stuff that's killing you and, and you got to start getting into changing, right? Changing I always and say growing. It's like 90% growing up. Oh, I, no, no doubt about it, man. Because those of us who are addicts, we're like spoiled four-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck? I want this. This doesn't feel good. Blah, blah, blah. My husband always teases me about it. He's like, you guys are like, oh, that doesn't. Oh, well, it doesn't feel good. Get up and do it. You got to go to work. You got to do this stuff. Because how many addicts do we know in early recovery? And they're like, I don't want to go to work. I don't want. I just want to lay on the beach. I just want to surf. I just want. Yeah. Oh, well. I'm 24. Grow the fuck and, up. And I, and I applied for this job. I have no skills and I need to be CEO next right, month. Right, right. I want to make $80,000 <laughs> a year. And I'm like, go fucking work at McDonald's like the rest of us started. That's right. It's just part of life. Just grow up. Yeah, it's it's really tough to get through to some to, to get through a lot of these people. That's like, man, it, just do something and any anything but idle time. That idle time is oh. going to absolutely kill you. You got to work. You right? got to do something. I mean... The the time in my life when I felt depressed has been when I'm not working. Oh yeah. And I'm just like going to me. I mean, I do go to a lot of meetings and help a lot of people, but I'm like not producing anything. And I think we have to do good to feel good. No doubt about it. I I, I I've had these handfuls of what I call these guys. I call like junior M and M's. These guys who <laughs> they're, they're from like 
Beverly Hills or yeah. freaking South Orange County, and and, and they, they act like they're from Eight Mile in Detroit. Yeah. Oh, you, I you, love it. You, you, you know, it, th- first off, they're not gang members. Yes. They're they're not tough. Yeah. And they, they talk like they're from you know the hood in Detroit, and it's like, dude, have you ever had a job, huh? Dude. Dude, you're 26. You still live at home. <laughs> you need you a gotta, job. You gotta, you gotta work, man. Self-supporting we, through we, your own contributions. We work in recovery, man. It's it's J O. It's J and O and a B. Get one, man. You might feel better. You, self-esteem is so important. We when we come into recovery, we either have our self-esteem is either completely broken or we've never had it to begin mm-hmm. with. You know. Mm-hmm. And to develop a little self-esteem in a positive way, not in an arrogant way, to build it. But esteemable bit bit. acts create Hell self-esteem. Yeah. No doubt about you it. You have to do esteemable acts to create. You're not going to lay there on your, on the beach, and create self-esteem. You got to be picking up trash. You got to be helping other people. You got to be doing shit to create self-esteem. You mean scoring chicks and smoking cigarettes at meetings is not going to no, build your self-esteem. It's not going to build your self-esteem. <laughs> It's probably going to do the opposite. But that's what all those new guys tell me. They're like, man, dude, I, dude, I'm sober 30 days. I'm in love, man. It's like, dude, is it cool? I'm, I'm doing really well. People tell me all the time. They're like, I'm in love. And I go, <laughs> I've never seen it work in 29 years. And they go, well, maybe I'm the first. May, may, you're like, maybe. Maybe you are the There's first. There's a first for but everything. But I seriously doubt it. <laughs> I seriously think you're going to end up broken and maybe you won't relapse but you will be on the floor bawling your eyes out wondering why your life is so shitty your life is so shitty because you didn't follow direction you didn't do what we asked you to do and you didn't get a job (laughs) that's right that's right and you didn't yeah damn it and you're fucked you are fucked (laughs) You are fucked because you're we left can alone with your. Show. I know. I was on a show not too long ago, and I was like, "Oh my!" This uh, this show called Sex with Emily. That's really funny, and she's showing me all these sex toys, and I'm like, "Can we say that?" And she's like, "Yeah, you're on a podcast. You can say anything you want." And I go, "Oh, okay." It's a sh- there's a show called Sex with Emily. Yeah, it's good. She's really funny. She's like a PhD doctor, and she's super cute. And she, um, she's little and she's adorable. And she does, she talks about sex. She has like porn stars on and, huh. um, and she had me on to talk about relationships, but she had to talk about sex too. She needs to have me on. She I'm going to talk have about on. my new radio show called K fucked. Yes. She yeah. would love to have you on. She would laugh so hard. Yeah. You would like her. She's really funny. Emily. <laughs> Perfect. That sounds awesome. Yeah. She's good. So Deanna, um, as, as we close out a little bit, could you, could you share with it, with the people who are watching on Facebook live and people who are going to be listening later on iTunes, anyone who, who's out there struggling with alcoholism or addiction, you know, share something with them. That, you know what? You can get the other side of this stuff. You have to ask for help. I don't care where you are, who you are. Everyone thinks they can do it by themselves. Like that's the American dream, right? I got this. I can do it by myself. You have to break out of your mold and ask for help. Ask your family, ask your teacher, ask your doctor, ask somebody, ask somebody to take you to a meeting, ask somebody to get you into rehab, call your insurance company. You have to ask for help. You have to reach out your hand and say, you have to admit that you're not doing very well because you're not. That's right. And you have to say, I need help. That's right. That's one of the hardest things. It's one of the hardest things for us to do with for us self managers is right? to ask for help. And I'm and I, I I appreciate that message. And if and if any of you guys want want to wonder how you can uh, uh, get a hold of Deanna, feel free to contact me at toddzalkins.com or you can go to newmethodwellness.com. Correct? Yeah, totally. Okay. And uh, before we cut, and by the way, Deanna, thank you so much. It was for, so fun. For, for, I can't for, believe it was like already done. I could talk here for like 10 hours. Y- you know, we, we could just make several more cups of coffee <laughs> and, and we can probably get the people from KFUCK to kind of wedge in here. We could Don't do we multicast. love caffeine? Uh, yes. We lo- um, I always say. It's never going to be given up. If caffeine is ever. wrong, I don't want to be right. Oh, yeah. It's not leaving me. Isn't that like a song? If caffeine is wrong, I don't want to be right. If it hasn't been written, we're I writing think you should it today. Write it. You should write it. Oh, my God. Yeah, I love caffeine. Um, I'm, about, I'm, like, I'm like a two to three a cup a day guy. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. This has been an absolute wonderful show today. It's really and fun. I I'm really so glad appreciate it. For, Anytime. Thank you for everything that you do and everything that you've done for me again. And before we cut out of here, guys, I want a, uh, a couple of announcements. Please, you guys, check out the org and 
get yourself a couple of Bradley's House t-shirts. We are on a roll with raising money for Bradley's House. And yes. the more that you guys, uh, the more that you guys check it out and spread the love about what we're doing for the first ever, the very first ever treatment center that is dedicated to helping musicians who are addicted to opiates. We're getting, we're, you guys, we're just around the corner, I swear, you know, it, it's going to happen. And by the way, on May 11th, we, we've got a, um, a benefit show at the Wayfarer in Costa Mesa. Uh, Corn Doggy Dog is playing in support of Burritos Band uh, May 11th at the Wayfarer. Also, come on out. Show come your support. On out. Mike D is going to be playing with us as well. So fun. It's going to be freaking epic, and we're going to have a great time. Plenty of Bradley's House t-shirts will be there. Check it out, the thenollfamilyfoundation.org. And if you have any questions and want to send us an email, hang out. What's our email address? I always forget it. Podcast at toddzalkins.com. Okay, I have to go because I have to go pee. Is that okay? Uh, you're still live. That's good. She's got to use the restroom. Thank you guys Thank you so guys. much for Thanks having for us. She's got to use the restroom. Thank you guys. Mm-hmm.